Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on emotions. So I have a question for you. Does this MCAT make you emotional? Well, for me, it was the most breakdowns I ever had in my life. But hey, let's understand what's going on. First, we're going to hit theories of emotion. It really helps to understand their thought process because if you were like me, these theories made no common sense when I heard them. We will then wrap up by explaining all of them together. First is the James Lang theory. They were both studying the body viscera, aka the organs, and they noticed that impulses went from the organs to the cortex and they were interpreted there. So they theorized we experience our bodily arousal before our brain can even interpret our emotions. So the arousal occurs before the emotion we experience. Well, who criticized this theory? Well, Cannon, of course. He and Barr determined that information from the viscera was unnecessary for emotions during their experiments on rodents. They argued that physical and psychological arousal happen simultaneously and are sent through the distribution center of the brain. So what structure must this be referring to? Well, the thalamus, of course. The thalamus is the relay center of the brain. Next, the Shatner-Singer theory, also known as the two-factor theory was developed based on the 1962 experiment where they had researchers give two male groups an injection of either epinephrine or saline. The epi groups were then told of the expected effect, that there could be side effects, or told nothing at all. Then the experimenters went into the room and tried to anger or make laugh the participants, and results were recorded via one-way mirrors. Results revealed that anger and happiness was heightened but not in the informed or control groups. Thus, the theory proposed that the situation required interpretation. Lastly, the low-yield one, which may not actually be on the exam, Lazarus's appraisal theory of emotion. And it's basically common sense. It states that we think or interpret before the physiological arousal and emotion. Lazarus is also the person who discovered the stress theory of cognitive appraisal, involving primary and secondary appraisal discussed in the cognitive stress episode. So let's go through them all once more using the experience of a terrifying dog. And quotes from an image by Cengage Learning. James Lang theory involves arousal then the emotion. So the quote, I feel afraid because I tremble. I feel afraid because I tremble. Canon Bard argues conscious emotion and autonomic arousal happen simultaneously. Think of a common bar or balance beam to think of both happening at once. Thus, the dog makes me tremble and feel afraid. The dog makes me tremble and feel afraid. Shatner Singer theory argues there is arousal, then appraisal of the situation, then the emotion. So, I label my trembling as fear because I appraise the situation as dangerous. I label my trembling as fear because I appraise the situation as dangerous. I don't remember the last time I ran into a terrifying dog, but I can guarantee that's not what I was thinking. And lastly, the one that I think we can all agree with, Lazarus's cognitive appraisal, which states we have conscious interpretation and then stimulus, emotion, and arousal. So, I tremble because I feel afraid. I tremble because I feel afraid. Okay. So what are the types of emotions? Well, Paul Ekman outlines seven universal emotions. Happiness, sadness, contempt, surprise, fear, disgust, and anger, which he found in all places of the world. You don't have to memorize each of those, though. Think eek, because Ekman is spelled with E-K, and I think eek as a facial expression. His data supports Charles Darwin's theory of emotions in that they are universal and evolutionarily selected for. Just a quick note, the social constructionist approach to emotion would argue that there could be universal emotions, but social constructionists would argue that emotions themselves are really just a construct of the culture we live in, and it would just be coincidental that all our cultures have these emotions or it's some type of social construct that we all have constructed. Back to facial expressions. John Gottman, a psychologist working on marriages, I think got man for Gottman, had a 90% accuracy of determining if a couple would divorce. Can you guess what universal emotion he looked for among the other things? Contempt. Exactly. If you showed contempt for your partner, you essentially have a death wish for your relationship. Gottman also claims 69% of a relationships end from unresolvable problems. But hey, maybe if they did that number a little bit more often, they can get through it. 
Hey, have you ever heard of emotional contagion? Well, it's the idea that your mood is dependent on the attitudes of those around us. If everyone is pessimistic, you're likely to be pessimistic, and the vice versa is true. This relates to facial feedback hypothesis, which proposes our facial expressions are self-enhancing. By smiling, we become happier, and frowning would make us more depressed. As the motivational speaker Les Brown says, you need to remove the negative, toxic people from your life to grow and gain success. The emotional contagion and facial feedback hypothesis is a perfect reason of why. In addition to pessimistic people influencing negative emotions, what does that mean for positive emotions? Well, yes, facial feedback argues pessimistic ones are enhanced, but the imponent process theory by Solomon, a different Solomon than the conformity experiments, argued that aversive conditioning studies show that one emotion, like sadness, will temporarily suppress the opposite emotion, like happiness, so the opponent process theory, which can, however, cause an uptick in that opposite emotion afterwards. Like after feeling good from that reefer, you start to feel increasingly sad after the high is gone. Opponent process theory of color vision is different than this one, by the way, so please keep that in mind. But it's worth being super emotional at times to relieve that emotion, like in catharsis. And in the case of sorrow, doing something good for others can also relieve that emotion, and indeed, you're more likely to do it too when you're sad. This is called the negative state release model. It argues you can release the negative state by helping others. Negative state release model. Now let's discuss aggression. When you encounter some events that pisses you off, say dropping your pencil you just picked up, the cognitive neo-association theory argues that you're going to start displacing your anger onto anyone who appears mildly aggressive towards you. So what theory does this also include? Well, the cognitive neo-association theory also includes the frustration-aggression theory, which was coined prior to the cognitive neo-association theory. The frustration-aggression theory is exemplified in irrational sports fans who start throwing hot dogs, beer, and picking fights with people, so they act aggressive because their goal of winning becomes threatened, so they get frustrated and then show aggression. So cognitive neo-association theory states crappy situations lead to aggressive behaviors, which also includes frustration-aggression hypothesis for how frustration leads to aggression. Now, there are two aggression types. Do you remember them? Yes, instrumental and hostile aggression. It's pretty easy to remember. Instrumental aggression is aggression which is incidental in trying to achieve a goal, such as accidentally injuring someone in football, whereas hostile aggression is intentionally causing pain to someone, such as throwing scolding hot coffee at someone because they said hello to you on one of your bad days. If you remember back to Karen Horney and her 10 neurotic needs, there were some basic emotions when those neurotic needs weren't met that we should discuss here. She claimed basic hostility and basic anxiety kind of like that aggression just talked about. Basic hostility was a result of the basic evil your parents gave you from their poor parenting and abuse, those evil people. This manifested itself into, into basic hostility towards others because you couldn't show your hostility towards your parents. Or that basic evil manifested itself into basic anxiety from the inevitable dependence you had on your evil parents. <laughs> You couldn't leave, but you were mistreated. So you think, if my parents treated me poorly, then I can only imagine how everyone else is. These basic emotions manifest during childhood and later in life as well. Finally, there are some ways to modify your emotions. Focus on what modifications might mean. You shouldn't have to memorize these. First, situational modification is modifying your external environment to change its emotional impact, like cracking a joke at a funeral to modify the situation. Next, cognitive change, which involves changing how you perceive the emotional impact of a situation. For instance, distancing yourself or trying to interpret the situation in a different light. Situational selection is avoiding or choosing places because of their emotional impact, like avoiding the places your ex and you visited by selecting to go to a different location. Lastly, attentional deployment involves, as you would expect, changing how you deploy your attention. So you could focus on the issue and ruminate about it, or you could distract yourself by finding a new person to deploy your attention. 
And that is the end of the episode.